Hello, welcome to another episode of James and Chris Science Videos, where today we're going to be looking at springs and Hooke's Law. Um, Hooke's Law comes in the extension, the springs are the main bit, and we're going to focus on uh, what springs are, what the word elasticity means, and then we're going to look at some experiments where we can add masses to springs and see what they do. So let's start off with that word elasticity and the word elastic. So what does the word elastic mean? Well, elastic is any material that if you stretch it or compress it, when you finish stretching or compressing it, it will return to normal. And inelastic, the opposite, sometimes called a plastic bit of material, that will, when you pull it, will change, will keep its shape. So Play-Doh, for example, if I pull Play-Doh or Plasticine into a shape, then I let go, it stays in that shape. It doesn't return back to its normal form. It's got zero elasticity. It's important to notice as well that if I overextend and overpull an elastic material, it has something called an elastic limit. And if I go beyond that elastic limit, it, it changes shape and it stays in that shape. It loses its elasticity. And we say it becomes denatured. So you find with a spring, and I'll show you in a little bit in the video later, what happens if you overextend a spring and what happens with that. So let's start off with an experiment. So here is a diagram of experiment I'm going to go to the lab and do. We've got a stand, a boss and clamp, and with it we've got a spring attached to it. And attached to that we're going to put some masses. The measurements that we're going to take are going to be the measurements of the length of spring and the length of the extension. So let's go to the lab now um, and let's do this experiment. Okay, here we are. We're going to do an experiment on a spring where we're going to look at measuring the extension of this spring whilst I add some masses on. And I'll show you how that goes very quickly with this setup. Then I'm going to give you some made up results that I want you to put into a graph. I also want you to see uh, the difference between arrangements of springs. We can have a spring on its own. We can have two springs together like this. We call that series, one spring after the other. And we can have two springs side by side like this. We call that parallel. So we're going to look at the effect that adding mass has to the extension of those different systems. So the first system, what we're going to do here, I'm going to put our spring here. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention elasticity and elastic limits. So what is elastic? What does that word mean? Well, it means if I pull an object, an elastic material will return to its original shape. So if I continue to pull it, it will always go back to its original shape. Each object that has elastic potential properties has something called an elastic limit, which is if I push it beyond its elastic limit and let go, it no longer returns to its original shape. And we say that has exceeded its elastic limit. And that's going to affect some of the results. Each spring that we're going to use has an elastic limit. And once exceeded, the results are going to change. Um, and you'll see that as we do it. So we're going to measure this and we're going to see what the extension is as I add different masses. We're going to talk about the force on that. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to look at this, and the length of my spring, if I look at that, is five centimeters. So I'm going to write on my little board up here, the length of my spring is five centimeters. And that means an extension of zero means it hasn't got any bigger from its original size, which is unsurprising because I haven't put any force on. Now, I should really quickly say about this, um, these are 100 gram masses. 100 gram masses are useful because they are a force of one newton in gravity because the Earth's gravitational pull is approximately 10 newtons per kilogram, which means 100 grams equals one newton. So that's going to be quite useful because each of these is going to represent one newton. So if I put one newton onto my spring, -da, you can see it stretches. So I'm going to put my ruler on. I'm going to measure that. There we go. And that is 8.2 centimetres. 8.2 centimetres. So you now from here can work out the extension. The extension is going to be the length of the spring with the mass on minus the length of the spring on its own. So 8.2 minus 5 is going to equal an extension of 3.2 centimetres. That is the extension for one newton. Now, if I add a second newton onto here, 
I've now got a new extension, and my new extension is there is 11.4. So again, the new extension is going to be that number minus that number, and that is 6.4. So the observance of you will notice that that is a rise of 3.2, and that is a rise of 3.2. So each time I put a Newton's worth of force on, I extend it by the same amount. We can start predicting my extension for 3 should be, work this out, uh, 9.6. So let's try that. Let's put on a mass here. Put my ruler on here. Measure from there to there. Okay. Look at that, 14.6. Oh, perfect, 14.6. So 14.6, perfect. Look at that, 14.6. So we can say the relationship here is a linear relationship. It goes up equally each time. So I'm going to present you a table in a minute where that's going to be filled up. It's going to be different results. I want you to plot it on a piece of graph paper. Um, I'm going to put that onto your OneNote, so that'll be there. Uh, and I want you to see what happens. Now, we're going to reach an elastic limit somewhere around here. And you'll be able to see that on your graph. And I want you to see what happens when we reach the elastic limit. So I'm not going to show you this here. I want you to see that via the results. So let's change the situation slightly. And I'm going to take a spring, and I'm going to put it together with another spring like so. There, a bit fiddly, but we'll get that. There we go. Okay, so now two springs in parallel. I'm going to put this onto here, like so, and I'm going to measure this here because we have to start off with our initial spring length again. That initial spring length, unsurprisingly, <laughs> is ten centimeters. So I'm going to take that off. This is going to be for a series set of springs. And I'll start off with 10 centimetres here. Extension of zero. And I'll start by putting on one mass. So just one mass at this point here. So now you can see it's extended there. So I'm going to measure it again here. And I've got 16.4. So let's put that onto the table. 16.4. So 16.4 gives an extension of 6.4 centimetres. It means each spring here has extended by 3.2, which was the same as what we had with a single spring. So by putting two springs on, our overall extension has doubled. Each spring extends by the same amount. So that is springs in series. Springs in parallel are where I'm going to put, let's put this the other way around, two springs side by side. Let's put another spring down. There we go. So again, we start off with this and the length of the spring, five centimeters. I'm going to put one Newton onto here. Now you might have observed that that hasn't extended by nearly as much. You put this onto here. So there we go. That is 6.6 .6 centimetres. So for this second spring, second example, we've got here 5 and we had 6.2. Centimeters. No, I was going to say 6.2, I said 6.6 .6 in my, my, my little memory. So that is an extension of 1.6. So 1.6 centimeters. Now, again, you'll see in this case the springs 
in parallel like this, share the load. So one spring of its own had an extension of 3.2, half of 3.2 is 1.6, which means now it's shared across each of those. We've got 1.6, so 1.6 there. So parallel shares it, series combines it, adds it together. So there's the difference between those two kind of systems. So I'll, I'll write a summary for that so that you've got a summary for the difference between series parallel and single springs. Excellent, so we've seen the extension of the springs and we've seen that it's a linear relationship. So if I put forces on, it extends by the same amount each time I add a force. So I can reverse engineer that. If one Newton gives me an extension of 3.2 centimetres, I know that an extension of 3.2 centimetres must be a force of one Newton. So I can therefore use springs to measure forces. And we do that via a device called a force meter. And here is a force meter here. It's a very simple device. It's just a spring, a meter reading, and a hook. And all it says is that if the, if the spring is stretched and extends, it will tell me a reading of what that equates to in terms of Newtons. So if I pull down by this much, I'm pulling down with a force of 6 Newtons. And that causes that extension. There's 10 Newtons. And so I can use this force meter and the, the extension of springs to measure forces. So, brilliant. Coming up on the screen now is a series of results that I have done for you. So this is just one spring done on its own by adding masses and then measuring the length of the spring. So you've got two things to do here. The first of which is to copy the table out and to work out the extension of the spring. Second um, is to make a graph of this and to see if you can spot the point where the spring loses its elastic potential. And when you draw the graph, that should be fairly obvious. So let's summarize, shall we? For springs, let's go with elastic means an object will return to its shape when pushed or pulled. So we can change that shape, we'll return back. Every object has an elastic limit. That elastic limit may be zero, which means it will just change shape anyway. But when it goes beyond that elastic limit, it becomes denatured. Next one is springs will extend by regular amounts um, if regular forces are exerted. So if I add one newton, it extends by one centimetre. If I put two newtons, it's going to extend by two centimetres. Three newtons will be three centimetres, and so on. So there's a, a direct relationship between the force that I put on and the amount that it extends. I could put springs in series. When I put springs in series, it's going to double. And if I put springs in parallel, it's going to half. We can also use springs to make force meters, which are useful for us to measure forces. So um, that concludes the lesson for those that are doing the main bit. If you wish to do the extension, please stay on the video. And I'll quickly talk you through the extension now, which is about Hooke's law. So extension. Um, here's Hooke's law. Um, Robert Hooke was a scientist in the 17th century. So around 1660, this was um, attributed to him. And this is the equation that he came up with said F equals K times X, where F is the force applied on the spring, measured in Newtons. K is a constant. That is going to represent the spring. We're going to come back to that in a second. X is going to be the extension of the spring. Now, the spring constant is going to be the same for every spring, as long as it doesn't reach its elastic limit. So what I want you to do with the graph that you've taken and looked at and done and plotted, what I'd like you to do is for that, ignoring the parts where we have gone beyond the elastic limit, I'd like you to rearrange the equation to find out the value of k. Once you've found the value of k, that will remain the same for all of the data points. So for 1 newton, 2 newtons, 3 newtons, 4 newtons, k will be the same for each one, it remains constant. And that'll be the same for any spring of that design and material. Each spring has its own constant, and that constant will remain the same until it breaks its elastic limit. And that is the nature of Hooke's law. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.